Okay, so welcome back. Um, I'd like to pick up where I left off last time, which was um, discussing the ample nef, some ample, and big cones. Um, I'll actually kind of just stick to amp ample nef and big cones uh, since uh, semi ample is sort of has the kind of the same numerical properties as nef and is harder to keep track of in terms of the cone picture. Um, but I want to revisit that. So last time we did the blow up of P2 at one point, and now I want to look at blow up of P2 at two points. Uh, and so the idea is, you know, you have your projective space, which I guess I should probably draw it as like a triangle actually, because uh, that's how it looks in toric geometry. And then you blow up two points, which you might as well choose the uh, two of the coordinate points because, uh, well, the projective space is very symmetric. It has a very large symmetry group, uh, corresponding to the fact that you can just pick, you know, a projective space will come from a vector space, and you can pick any basis you want, and changing the basis will give you an action of uh, PGL on the projective space, and so you can move points around pretty easily. And so the idea is that, well, you know, if you have two points that aren't the same one, you can just pick them to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and, and then, you know, maybe your third point. I mean, there's no third point, but if you had a third one, you'd probably pick the third coordinate point. And so when you blow up, you replace each of these points with a line, with a P1. And so let me draw this picture a little more rectilinearly. So this is our P2, our P2, I mean. And I'm going to blow up this point and that point. And I get this picture here. And I guess to make it more symmetric, maybe it's a little easier to blow up that point just to keep the picture the way I'm used to it. And now the sides of this polygon, so this is the, the, the toric geometry picture from the polytope perspective. So uh, there's a lot of ways to interpret this picture, but the way um, I like to keep in mind for now is that when you have a toric variety, you have uh, the action of an algebraic torus on your on your space, and the algebraic torus that's you know product of a bunch of copies of the uh, the invertible complex numbers, so the non-zero complex numbers. And inside you have uh, well inside C star you have the unit circle. So every copy, so you get a real torus inside the algebraic torus, which is compact. And so if you quotient by that torus, then you get this picture right here. And the beauty of this picture, so this is called the, the moment map. And the idea is that, in fact, over this large cell here, uh, you're quotienting by the full S1 squared. And then uh, on the boundary, you get non-trivial stabilizers. So the stabilizer at each of these points, these are torus fixed points, and then each of these lines gives you a P1. And so the picture over each P1 is that you have a north pole, a south pole, and then you have circles that are getting bigger. But those are just, you know, like your lines of latitude. So this picture, you know, the you know, it looks schematic, but it really is like if you know how to interpret it, it really is telling you what's going on in the uh, complex geometry. So you can see this is like a complex P1. CP1 is uh, topologically the sphere. Okay, and so now we can also just label each of these uh, these P1s. So these give you divisors because they're uh, algebraic subsets of codimension one, and we can label them with. Uh, well, how they were obtained from downstairs on this P2. So the idea might be like, well, this is, you know, um, 
So I guess we could say this is like the y-axis, this is the x-axis, and this is the z-axis. And then if I blow up, well, you know, I should, you know, I'm going to abuse notation by using, you know, by not decorating this, this should really be like, you know, pi upper star or something. Well, it's, uh, it's like really the pullback of this divisor. But I don't want to clutter things. And then LZ should have the class. Okay, so let me know. The idea here is that this, this guy here, this LY, if I pull it back, it's going to vanish along here as well. So if I give these exceptional divisors names, I have here, I have L minus E1. Here I have L minus E2. And here I have L minus E1 minus E2. Okay, and so the idea is that this L minus E1, it's representing the strict transform of a line through the, po the first point, point one, so let's just call this P1, this point uh, P2. And the E1 is the pre-image of P1. It's all the, the points lying over this, P, this, this uh, coordinate point here. Likewise with this E2 and this point number two. And then L minus E1 minus E2, well that's the strict transform of the unique line in this P2 that uh, connects the two points that we chose. So, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, two points in the plane, they're not the same, they determine a unique line, and it's the same in projective space. And in fact, in projective space, things are a little bit better because any two lines also uniquely determine a point. You know, you don't have to worry about lines being parallel because they'll intersect at infinity. Okay, so keeping all this in mind, we can now draw the uh, various cones and divisors. Okay, so we'll start with the effective cone, which is just the cone of all of the effective divisors. And that's going to be three dimensional because, well, I have three independent classes here. I have E1, uh, E1, E2, and you know, L, and, or, and I can pick any one of these to be the third basis element. It's kind of natural to pick this one because I can write L minus E1 as a sum of this and E2. Likewise, L minus E2 is a sum of this and E1. And it's a general fact about toric varieties that their effective cone is spanned by the torus invariant divisors. So we can use that here. Now, because this cone is three dimensional, but the board is two dimensional, then the way I draw this cone is I just draw a slice of it because it's a cone. If you draw a slice of the cone, then it's the same information as if you've drawn the entire cone. So what I can do then is I can draw it in a nice kind of symmetric way, is so I can put L minus E1 minus E2 up here. I can put uh, E1 down here. And okay. I don't want to make this picture as symmetric as possible. Um, that's pretty good. Let's make it really big, though. Yeah, so I want just a big triangle. There we go. And E1, uh, L minus E1 minus E2, and E2 down here. And what you should keep in mind is that, I mean, this is supposed to be a cone. So really what's happening is that I have, you know, I have zero off here. And then if I comb this off, it looks like a three-dimensional guy. But, you know, this is not really giving us any more information. It's all kind of implicit in what's in the picture. So, you know, normally I don't draw this part. Okay, so, yeah, so here we can, of course, exploit the toric geometry. But, um, so the thing, to keep in mind here is the uh, what determines the ample cone is positivity is the ample cone is essentially the cone where all the curve classes are positive. So you know that you know this is a, a statement that's tricky to get precisely correct. Um, I think the best way to remember it is that the Neff cone is the closed cone where all the effective curve classes are non-negative, and then the ample cone is its interior. 
So the curve classes, we know what they are, the effective ones, because I just wrote them down here, right? So this is a peculiar thing to surfaces, is that the curve classes are the same as the divisor classes. So that kind of makes, you know, conceptualizing what's going on and drawing it a little bit easier, but it can be kind of misleading because, uh, you know, next we're going to want to go to three dimensions, and then things are a bit trickier, right? Because the, the curve classes are not the same as the, as the divisors. The divisors are always the co-dimension one classes, and, you know, it's just a nice peculiarity of dimension two that they agree here. Okay, so, so then what I can do is I can say, well, where is, you know, so this E1, it not only determines a point here, but there's a, there's a canonical pairing on, on this space because I can intersect any two curves. So I can say, well, E1 intersected with itself is negative one. E1 intersected with this guy up here, it's going to be a one because it has zero intersection with E2 and zero intersection with L because that's pulled back from the base. And then intersected with E2, we just said that was zero. So that means a nice line here where this is, you know, if I divisor dot E1 is equal to zero there. And we don't just care that it's equal to zero here, we care about which side is positive and which side is negative. So the positive side is on this side and the negative side is over here. And likewise, you know, I can do the same for E2. Okay, yeah, that looks pretty symmetric. You know, and I'll just sort of note that the plus side is over here, the minus side is over there, plus side is over here, the minus side is over there. And then the, the final class we have to keep track of is uh, L minus E1 minus E2. And that is equal to zero along here, once we notice that this class right here is L minus E2. Uh, let me make that big. So this right here is L minus E2, that goes right there. Uh, likewise, L minus E1 goes right here. And the line connecting them is where L minus E1 minus E2 is trivial. Okay. So this cone right here, the closed cone, this is the math cone. And then, you know, I'm not going to draw it in there, but you imagine I just remove the boundary. And this is the ample cone. Okay, so the idea is that the ample classes, as you'll recall, so how do we define all these things? Well, the ample classes were the ones defined so that if you take the projective, uh, projective map corresponding to that linear series or a power of that linear series, then you would get an embedding in the projective space. And that's exactly what you get. If you find some, you know, find some way to embed this in projective space, which you know you can use torque geometry for that or just the blow of construction, whatever you like, then it'll automatically, the, the pullback of O of 1 will automatically lie in this cone here. And so here I have this toric picture. Now, because this is a toric variety, all of the various birational modifications we make to it by considering uh, uh, pieces of this cone are going to also be toric varieties. So it's actually easier to fill in the bottom of the cone first. So let me, let me show you what happens there. So the idea is that when we touch this line where d dot e, e2 is equal to zero, so that corresponds to our divisor restricting to a degree zero bundle along the exceptional curve. And so a degree zero bundle, that means that if it, if it vanishes anywhere along here, it's going to vanish the entire place the, the, on the, along the entire curve. So what that means is that, that that series of divisors is no longer able to distinguish points along this curve 
And so the embedding coming from them is going to collapse that curve to a point. So what that corresponds to is just reversing the blow up and blowing back down this E2. So what we get is we still have E1. So we get P2 blown up at a single point. And then, you know, this, you know, the same argument, but just E1 and E2 switched gives us that we do the other blowdown over here. So we're blowing down E1 over here. And, you know, if you know torque geometry, you can identify these polytopes, you know, with, with the sort of, with the appropriate lattice, of course, but, you know, it's kind of not so hard to write down with the right lattices, um, that they, they give you uh, the toric polytope picture for uh, P2 blown up at a single point, which is, you know, also the Hertzberg surface F1. Okay, well then in this chamber down here, of course, you know, you've just done both steps, and so we're just reversing the entire blow up construction and ending up down back at this P2 over here. And this is not so surprising because if you work out, well, okay, so here, these two lines are where the intersection numbers with the two exceptional divisors are zero. So the point where they intersect, or rather the, the ray where they intersect, because this is really the picture of a cone, is the ray generated by the pullback of the line down there. So this is just L, this point right here. Okay. So, questions so far? Okay, so then we have to say, okay, well, what's going on up here? Well, what's happening up here is that there's actually one more birational transformation that we can do to this that's a contraction. And that's, we can also, now that we've blown up these two points, we can contract the strict transform of the line connecting them because each time you blow up a point along a line, its inter self-intersection number goes down by a one. So down here, all of the lines, they intersect in a single point. Uh, they self like their self-intersection is one. That, so that's just saying that any two lines intersect in a point, and you, know, you can move a line, you can kind of jiggle it a little, a little bit, and it'll inter intersect itself in a point. You know, that's kind of a, you know, not a very rigorous argument, but um, you, know, you, can, you can make it rigorous in this context. Um, and so, and so then when we blow up a point along that line, well, this guy and that guy, these have self-intersection zero. This guy has self-intersection minus one, which means it can be blown down. And when you do that, well, you just contract the segment, and that gives you the square which corresponds to the toric variety, P1 cross P1. So here we can see the birational uh, map from P2 to P1 cross P1 that's given by uh, taking the quadrix through uh, you know, two points in general position. This, the general position is a little redundant. Um, and in fact, you know, along here, this is, you, know, you have 2L minus E1 minus E2 which is the linear series of, or rather the strict, strict transform of the linear series of the quadrix through these two points, which just becomes a complete linear series up here. Okay, and so, and there we've just described the entire big cone. So the big cone is just the interior of this picture. The nap cone is the shaded region, and the ample cone is the interior of that. And in this picture, because we're on a torque variety, Everything that's neff is semi-ample. Every ring is finitely generated. This is why toric varieties are the first example of what's called Mori dream spaces, is that, is that all of the kind of nasty things you have to worry about with failure of finite generation, that kind of thing, don't happen. Everything is finitely generated. And in particular, all of the neff divisors are semi-ample. Okay. So the last thing I want to say about this picture is that you can even extend it to the boundaries because, you know, the, the boundaries, these also correspond to divisors and you can also try and, excuse me, uh, write down a map projective space with them. 
And the only difference is that map is no longer birational. So what's going to happen is it's going to be contraction. So in particular, uh, what you get is that, well, on one side, so the contractions, the way the contractions work are by taking the parallel lines in this picture and moving them closer and closer together until you just get a one line. So this is like a contraction onto a P1. And all along this guy, you get contraction onto a P1. All along that guy, you get contraction onto a P1. And then at the corners and along the bottom, you get contraction to a point. So, you know, this guy down here, and you, you can kind of see that because E1 and E2, well, they're, they're only, any combination of those, any positive combination of those is only gonna have one section. And then uh, a map coming from a single section, even if it's not defined everywhere, the places it is defined, it's just gonna send everything to one point. Okay, so I really like this picture because it, it's kind of complicated enough that you can see lots of interesting things going on. But it's simple enough that you can actually draw it on the board. So it's a kind of a happy medium. And it's also, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of a mixed blessing that it's uh, of a variety in two dimensions because, well, being in two dimensions makes it easier to visualize and think about, but it is a little misleading when you want to translate to what happens for three-dimensional things and higher. Okay, so that was what I wanted to go over from last time. How are we doing on time? Okay, cool. So it took about 20 minutes. So I have 30 minutes left. So my plan for today is to talk about projective space, which, uh, I mean, in particular, I want to review the Proj construction because we've already talked about projective space once in that we've described what maps projective space are. So from the kind of uh, you know, categorical algebraic geometry perspective, where you kind of, you think about the category of schemes and then, you know, you use the unit embedding and that kind of thing to understand what's going on. From that perspective, we already know what projective space is because we know how to map any variety of projective space. But in practice, when doing algebraic geometry, you also want to think about coordinate rings and things like that. So we want to be able to integrate the two perspectives. And so with that in mind, I want to think about projective space in a, like, in a very geometric way. Well, the kind of the idea of projective space actually comes from the idea of uh, perspective in art. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So the idea with perspective in art is that you know you're like you're trying to make a two-dimensional image of something three-dimensional. You know, so traditionally this might be like a painting or a drawing, and the way you do that is. You know, you have your kind of your scene, which is three dimensional out here. And then you have the observer. I'm trying to draw an eye here. Okay, so you have an eye here, which is um, the, the observer, and then they're going to look at things in the scene, but everything that's on the same line, you know, you can't tell the difference between th two things that are along the same line because, you know, I mean, either you can see through them and, and then it all kind of gets pushed together. Like when you look at the sky, you're actually, you know, seeing all the light scattered from the sun and it's, you know, kind of a cumulative thing over the entire atmosphere, that the section you're looking at. Or I'm looking at one of you who is, uh, you know, opaque, and so I can't see what's behind you. Okay, and then the idea is that when well, you're trying to paint the scene, so you have some two-dimensional canvas, 
and you know the idea is you're projecting things in the scene onto the canvas using your artistic skill or you know nowadays you can do it using computers okay so now when you have perspective in art traditionally there's three kinds there's one point two point and three point perspective so let me let me just demonstrate uh, those three ways of drawing so let me do one point perspective first um, and so for this one the way the way that this works is like you commonly see this when there's a single point of vanishing uh, a single perspective point where all where all the lines coalesce like on the horizon so you know you can imagine if I'm looking out there then the the parallel lines seem to meet in the distance so the idea is you have you know maybe you have a horizon but I'm not going to draw it today and then if I want to draw parallel lines let's see well the parallel lines all come off here and uh, yeah so well this is not something I'm really well trained to do so let me let me not try to do this off the cuff. Um, you, have, you have one point, two point, and three point perspective. So let's see. So the idea is, you know, let's say I wanted to draw um, a box. And then I'm going to draw all of the lines that. And then the idea is that and I'll leave the third line unseen. So, so here I have a single point of vanishing, and then you can see that it's like, oh yeah, you can see the, the box. If I had like a bunch of boxes stacked, they would seem to, if I had like a box behind this one, another one behind that one, You'd see them kind of vanishing off into the distance. That's one point pers perspective. Two point perspective is where I have two points on the horizon. And then, you know, if I want to draw my box, let's see, something like that. Okay, yeah, it's actually easier the more perspective lines you have. So you have this one, you have that guy, that guy, and that guy. Here I have this guy, this guy, and this guy. Ah, and then you can see, you know, if I have like something like a bunch of milk crates or something. see there it's like I have four crates stacked up like that you can see the illusion that it has three dimensions um, and you can see here I also have the illusion that it has three dimensions but it's a little different so here the difference is that um, you know here the if I think of myself as uh, let's say X Y and Z then the, the y-axis lines aren't actually parallel, the x and z ones are. And then here, uh, it's only the z-axis lines that are parallel, the x and the y ones aren't. And then for three-point perspective, well, then I have a third point down here. And let's see, so then if I want to draw my box, yeah, so this is like the top of my box. And then all right. 
So, and then, the idea is that There we go. Okay, so there's a lot of extra stuff here. But there you can see I have my box here, right? And I have three vanishing points. So this is like, I'm in the two point perspective, but like in the two point perspective, it's like the camera's on the ground. And then in the three point, it's like I lifted it up a little bit. Okay, so how do we interpret these you know, these three different things in terms of projective space that we know mathematically. Well, the idea is that, you know, here, so projective space, we can think of projective space as being the space of all lines to the origin. So, so P2 equals, you know, one definition, this is actually not the one we're going to go with, but what we, we can define this as the space of lines in three-dimensional vector space. So V so going to be, which will be through the origin. And in projective space, then you're essentially collapsing the dimension down by one. So you, you can like project points onto points, but the, the fibers of projection really are lines. The things that project onto lines are really planes, etc. And so what happens is that in projective space, so there's not really parallel lines anymore. So in regular space, parallel lines never intersect. But in projective space, if I take two lines that intersect at a unique point, I guess these should be distinct lines. Now, what we're doing when we make this drawing is you have your canvas, and the canvas is, you know, it's supposed to be like projective space. But of course, a canvas is not infinite, right? And projective space, it's supposed to extend, you know, it, it's not just supposed to include the lines to the canvas, but also the ones that go directly up. And so these, you know, the lines like this never hit the canvas, but these are also points of projective space. So the way that works mathematically is that I can parameterize my space of lines just by whatever non-zero point they go through. So these are called homogeneous coordinates. So we'll have a1, a2, a3, which is equivalent to lambda a1, lambda a2, and lambda a3 for non-zero lambda. And again, you know, this is going to work over any field. And I'm kind of telling you the story over the real numbers, although you know, in the in the class we're actually going to care about the complex numbers. So the idea here is that, you know, this is maybe the a1 direction. So here I'm setting a1 is equal to 1. So then I can just divide my other two guys by a1. So here the coordinates on here are going to be 1, a2 over a1, and a3 over a1. But if a1 is equal to 0, then I can't hit the canvas. And that's all these lines over here. So this is just a1 equals 0. Okay, so what does that have to do with one point, two point, and three point perspective? Well, the idea here is that when a1 equals zero, that's an entire p1 worth of stuff there, because then uh, what happens is that I get a2 and a3 are my homogeneous coordinates, and it's the same, uh, the same idea, except you know, I have one fewer coordinate. And then the perspective points are the coordinate points that don't lie on that line in infinity. So, and the reason there's not a zero point perspective is that uh, the three coordinate points, so those are corresponding to lines in the x, y, and z direction. You know, if you draw a picture of some buildings, there's gonna be naturally 
there's going to be kind of a natural set of orthonormal coordinates because you know the building, you know, they come up out of the ground and then there's you know one face that's perpendicular to another face. So you're going to have three kind of privileged directions and they're going to correspond to three non-collinear points of your projective space and which perspective you get depends on how many of those are at this you know are in the plane of the viewer which corresponds to the line at infinity in projective space. Okay I hope this was enlightening I thought you know I looked this up last night and thought it was kind of cool how this like you know this phenomenon from art and art history kind of fits with what we're doing mathematically. Um, you know, and when I looked it up on Wikipedia, there's also like four point perspective, but that requires, you know, that's, that's not coming from linear projection, that requires making straight lines into curved ones. So they call that curvilinear perspective. Okay, so I have about 15 minutes left. And I want to use that to switch gears again to, to now moving into the algebraic geometers version of projective space. So in particular, what I want to do is I want to review the proj construction. So the idea there, let me erase the board, is that we're going to build our projective space out of a polynomial ring by recognizing it as a graded ring. I mean, maybe I should call this the Hartshorn definition, but uh, let's say the algebraic geometry of Pn. And I mean, as always, I'm going to work over the complex numbers, although here it like really explicitly doesn't matter. All this works over the integers are just an arbitrary base ring or even base scheme. Um, but I guess I'll just use K for my base ring, uh, insinuating that it's a field, but it doesn't really have to be. Um, and so this is really, you know, I want to tell you how to get projective space as you would in Hartshorn chapter two. So the idea is we start with uh, the homogeneous coordinate ring. equal to k join x0 through xn. Okay, so these are the polynomials in n plus 1 variables. And we're going to kind of think of these as being our homogeneous coordinates on the projective space. And yeah, so it's, so one thing I should probably comment on is, is so over there I said, oh, it's the space of lines. Uh, in algebraic geometry, for reasons I don't really want to get into, it's more traditional to think of projective space as the uh, space of quotients of a vector space, which is the same as thinking of it as lines in the dual space. And so it's always this annoying business of a vector space and its dual being isomorphic but not canonically so, so you can't like treat them like they're the same, but you can, you know, you know an experienced person can say all sorts of false things, but not really uh, step, uh, really step into it, but you know, you have to, you have to be careful. Anyway, so you start with this homogeneous coordinate ring, and then you take proj of S, and for this construction to work, so this is a construction like spec that takes in a ring and outputs a scheme, but in this case, S has to be a graded ring. So the idea is that S, you can think of it as the direct sum of S0, S1, et cetera. So I goes from zero to infinity, where SI 
is the elements of degree i. So these are, just think of this as the vector space, you know, x naught to the i, x naught to the i minus one x one, and you know, there's a combinatorial formula, it's a, um, you know, it's a generalized combination to, to figure out how many of these are slash actually write them down, um, x n to the i. So, you know, this vector, so this ring decomposes a bunch of finite dimensional vector spaces, and that gives it the structure of a graded ring. And the idea here is what you do to produce um, the projective space is you say, okay, the, the only functions that are going to count for me are the ones of degree zero. So these higher degree functions are not actually going to give me functions on my projective space. The only function on projective space I have is the only degree zero function in here, which is, well, the, the field values. And this, you know, this is the fact that a bounded entire function is constant. So if you have a function on all of projective space, that's a God's honest function that's uh, analytic everywhere even, but for our cases, for our purposes, algebraic, then it has to be a constant function. Okay, well, that's not really producing a very interesting space so far because, you know, we need, if we just have the functions k, that just gives us a point. And that corresponds to the fact that the, uh, that if you map projective space, if you try to map it to an affine scheme, then the image is going to be a point. Okay, but the same is not true for subsets of projective space. You know, every, every algebraic variety has to be covered by affine ones. So the same has to be true for projective space. So, so we, uh, so given some function, <clears throat> let's say some element f in the ring, which is homogeneous, so f belongs to some s sub i, then we're going to set a sub f to equal spec of the following ring. So what I want to do is I want to take s and then join f inverse. So this is like a normal thing to do. It's like to say, okay, in algebraic geometry land, inverting f is like saying the places where f is zero, we just we're inverting the we're 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 looking away from there. So we're looking at an open set where where f doesn't vanish. But again, we just want to take the degree zero guys. So we get just the degree zero guys here. And that's basically the entire construction. So in Hartshorn, you know, they want to define this as a topological space to say, well, the, um, the, the points are the homogeneous prime ideals and, you know, blah, 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 blah. But I mean, really, you just have to think about, once you have spec, you're just really thinking about this right here. And then the point is that you have to say, well, if I pick different values of f, then these are going to glue in some way. And I just have to make sure that that gluing is compatible so that I actually, they all fit together to make a scheme. And in fact, they do. So, you know, this is something that, you know, you should check if you haven't before, but I don't really want to get super into the weeds about doing that. So, okay, so what does this look like for our projective space? So in particular, you know, we don't want to have to compute this, so then, we, we, so then there's like a natural way to glue these, and then we would just say that prod of S is equal to just the union of all of these A sub Fs, where F is in Si for I greater than one, greater than or equal to one. Okay, so in the case of projective space, what does this look like? Well, the, uh, so, so one thing that, so it's a little bit awkward that you have these Fs, right, that, that you have all of these, but uh, what you can work out is that, um, you know, in the case of the polynomial ring, the elements of degree one generate the entire ring. So I can just assume that F has degree one, and if I want an open covering that covers everything, I can just take, uh, you know, vector space generators, a basis for those degree one guys. So, so specifically, 
we have an open cover, or when uh, you know f equals x naught, x one up through x n. And it's kind of worth seeing like what happens when f equals x naught. So if I look at a sub x naught, well, what do I have? I have spec of uh, a join x naught through xn, and then I join the inverse of x naught, and then I take the degree zero guys. Okay, so if I'm taking the degree zero guys, that means the total degree has to be zero. So in particular, I do get the field back, but I also get other stuff. And because these guys generate the ring, then I don't, then, then these guys times x naught inverse are going to generate the degree zero part of the ring. Because, you know, whatever I get in here, uh, to get it to be a degree zero part, I have to multiply it by however many copies of x naught inverse. So what I'm getting here is I just get x1 over x0, x2 over x0, up through xn over x0. And this is exactly the same picture as we had, I mean, I erased it, where you, know, you had the i and then you had the plane, and the idea was that in the plane, you were setting a1 equal to 1. Here, it's like we're setting x0 equal to 1, is that I can scale all of these by just you know, setting x0 equal to 1 or whatever. And then the way you glue with the other, uh, with the other sets is given by the relations between these monomials and you know, the monomials you get when, you're, when you invert x1 instead, or etc. Okay, so, see, I'm almost out of time, but, so this is just kind of like a brief review of the Praj construction. And when I first saw this construction, I had no idea what was going on. It was just like, oh great, I finally got an idea of what's going on in the spec, and now we have this new thing, which seems to be a lot more complicated. And in some ways it is, because, well, I mean, it is more complicated, because, you know, you have to you know, you, you're not doing like a global thing, you're kind of, you know, you're doing a bunch of local things and you're patching them together. But I think the thing that, that we should key in on is this zero here. Because why are we taking the things of degree zero? Well, what's really happening with this polynomial ring is that there's an action of the algebraic torus on this, which corresponds to the grading. So I have, in fact, that the algebraic torus acts on this guy via, you know, if I think of this as being given by t, so t sends f in uh, si goes to t z i times f. Okay. And so the idea is that when we're defining this, uh, this action here, so this grading corresponds to the action. So thinking of this geometrically, we could just say, oh, I have spec of this ring, which is a n plus one, acted by scaling by c star, which is just the, the scaling of homogeneous coordinates. It's the same scaling that gets you to different points on the line. And when you take invariance, you want to take the things that are not changed by this. So globally, there's no invariance. Or rather, globally, the, the invariants are just the field. But locally, you have more invariance because you can invert things and then produce elements of degree zero like all of these. So proj is really a quotient construction. And so our goal is going to be to generalize this idea of the quotient construction and integrate it with our previous ways of thinking about projective space, namely the way that you uh, map things to projective spaces using line bundles. Here we have kind of an alternate picture where the way you construct objects in projective space is using graded rings. 
And these seem to be linked by this notion of a torus action, that that's the connection between line bundles and graded rings that we're going to want to exploit later on in the course. Okay, so let's stop there, and we'll pick up next time.